this video, we're going to look at some corollaries to and examples of the division algorithm for polynomials. So let's go ahead and recall what that division algorithm says. So let's suppose that K is a field and f of x and g of x are polynomials in k adjoin x, in other words, they're polynomials whose coefficients are in k, then there are unique polynomials q of x and r of x, so that we can write f of x equals g of x times q of x plus r of x. And here we have this degree rule. The degree of r of x is bigger than or equal to zero, and it's strictly less than the degree of g of x. And here we're thinking about q as being the quotient of the polynomial, f of x and g of x, and r is the remainder after having taken that quotient. Okay, so our first corollary uh, goes like this. So let's suppose that alpha is a member of the field and it's a zero of f of x. In other words, if we plug alpha into the polynomial, then we get zero. So f of alpha equals zero. And so that's true if and only if f can be written as x minus alpha times g of x. In other words, x minus alpha divides the polynomial f of x. This is like a type of result that we always use in calculus, so we'd like it to be true over an arbitrary field. and this proof shows that it is. Okay, so this is an if and only if statement, which means we have two things to show, a forward direction and a reverse direction. So let's go ahead and look at the forward direction. In other words, let's suppose that f of alpha equals zero. In other words, alpha is a zero of f of x. And now we want what we want to do is do the division algorithm with f of x and our polynomial x minus alpha. And notice that's going to give us the following structure. We'll have f of x equals x minus alpha times g of x, where g of x is our quotient, plus r of x, where the degree of r of x is bigger than or equal to zero, and it's strictly less than the degree of x minus alpha. But the degree of x minus alpha equals one. That's pretty obvious. So what that tells us is that the degree of r of x is bigger than or equal to zero, strictly less than one. That means it's exactly equal to zero. In other words, it's just an element from the field. So that means we can write r of x equals beta, which is an element from the field k. Great. Now the next thing that we want to do is go ahead and evaluate f at alpha. So notice evaluating f at alpha, we know that's zero because that's given. And then that's also going to be equal to alpha minus alpha times g of alpha plus r of alpha. But this part's clearly zero. And then r evaluated at alpha is just beta. But what that tells us is that beta equals zero. Um, in other words, f of x equals x minus alpha times g of x plus zero, or x minus alpha divides uh, f of x. And so we've done this forward direction, so I'll clean up the board and then we'll do the reverse direction. Okay, so now we're ready for the reverse direction, which to be honest, there's not much to do. So let's suppose that f of x equals x minus a alpha times g of x. And what we want to show is that we, when we evaluate f at alpha, we get zero. But that is completely clear by the fact that we get alpha minus alpha times g of alpha, which is equal to zero. Okay, so that finishes this proof. So I'm going to do another corollary after I clean up the board. Okay, so our next result is related to the one that we just did, and it's actually a special case of a very general result, which um, is a really nice homework type exercise. So alpha in the field is a root of f of x and f prime of x, if and only if f of x can be written as x minus alpha squared times g of x. In other words, it's a root of degree two, um, or of multiplicity two sometimes, we would say that. Okay, great. So uh, let's go ahead and do the forward direction of this proof. Okay, so let's go ahead and suppose that f of alpha um, equals zero and f prime of alpha equals zero. 
So notice the fact that f of alpha equals zero tells us that we can write f of x as x minus alpha times g of x for some polynomial g of x in the field at joint x. Great. Now what we're going to do from here is take the derivative of both sides. And so taking the derivative of the left hand side just gives us the derivative. Taking the derivative of the right hand side we'll use the product rule. So that's going to give us x minus alpha g prime of x plus uh, g of x because the derivative of x minus alpha equals uh, just one. Okay, great. Now what we'll do is we'll evaluate this equation at alpha. So notice we get zero equals f prime of alpha, which equals x minus alpha, sorry, alpha minus alpha times g prime of alpha plus g of alpha. So obviously this part right here is zero. So what that leaves us with is g of alpha equals zero. But then, um, by our last corollary, that tells us that g of alpha equals x minus alpha times h of x. Sorry. Yeah, g of x equals x minus alpha times h of x by our last corollary. But now, putting this guy inside of this equation gives us f of x equals x minus alpha squared times h of x. Great, which finishes the proof of this direction. Okay, I'll clean up the board and then we'll do the other direction. Okay, so let's look at the other direction. In other words, we want to suppose that f of x equals x minus alpha squared times g of x. So notice that immediately shows us that um, f evaluated at alpha is alpha minus alpha squared times g of alpha, which is equal to zero. So that tells us that alpha is a root of f of x. Now we just need to show that alpha is a root of f prime, and we'll do that by taking the derivative of this equation right here. So notice, we'll get f prime of x equals, so that's going to be 2 times x minus alpha times g of x. So that's what we get from the product rule and kind of the chain rule for the left-hand term. And then this is going to be plus x minus alpha times g of x. Sorry, g, sorry, x minus alpha squared times g prime of x. Great. Now we just go ahead and evaluate that thing at alpha, and we clearly get zero. And so in other words, uh, we have satisfied um, the condition that we needed to for the reverse direction, and that finishes this proof. Okay, I'll clean up the board, and then we'll do one more corollary. Okay, for our next corollary, we will show that a non-zero polynomial f of x and k adjoin x of degree n can have at most n distinct roots in k. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and do this. We're going to do this by induction. So we'll do it on, by induction on the degree of f of x. So our base case will be the degree of f of x equals zero. But notice if the degree of f of x equals zero, that tells us that f of x equals uh, just some number alpha, which is inside the field, and we know that number is alpha, that number alpha is not equal to zero because we've already assumed that this is not the zero polynomial. But what that tells us is that f of x has uh, no zeros, or no roots, I should say, um, in k. But zero roots is less than or equal to the degree, so we're good to go here. Now let's go ahead and make our induction hypothesis. We want to suppose that this statement is true um, for all polynomials of degree less than n. So suppose true for polynomials of degree less than n and uh, consider uh, some polynomial f of x with degree n. So here we're using strong induction because we're not just assuming something is true for the case before, we're assuming it's true for all cases before. Now, uh, we have two cases 
within this induction part. And so case number one is f of x has no zeros or no roots. But in this case, uh, we're done because zero is less than or equal to n, which is the degree of f. Great. So now case number two is uh, f has at least one root. So we can write that in the following way. There exists some alpha in k such that f of alpha equals zero. Great. But by our earlier corollary, um, we can write f of x equals x minus alpha times g of x uh, with the degree of g of x uh, equal to n minus 1. So now what that tells us is that g of x has at most n minus 1 roots. Good. Now what we want to do is show that f of x has all of the roots of g of x and this number alpha, but nothing else. So let's go ahead and suppose that um, alpha is not equal to beta and g of beta is not equal to zero. So in other words, we have a number from the field that is not alpha and it's not a root of g. So what we want to show is that it's also not a root of f. And what that will do is that will show us that the only roots of f are alpha along with these n minus 1 roots of g. Putting that together, that's at most n roots. But that's actually pretty easy to do because we can do f of alpha equals beta minus alpha times g of beta, but we know that this is not zero because we're inside of a field which is an integral domain. So let's say this is because k is a field. Great. And then like I said, that means all of the roots of alpha are made up of this, sorry, all of the roots of f are made up of this new one, alpha, and then the n minus 1 old ones, so there are most n. Okay, so that finishes this proof. I'll clean up the board and then we're going to do an example. Okay, now we're going to look at an example of the division algorithm between f of x and g of x given by these polynomials, and we're going to do it twice. Once over q adjoint x, like you would do in like a pre-calculus class, and then once uh, and then once over z5 adjoint x. Notice z5 is also a field because 5 is prime. Okay, so uh, really the way to do this is just kind of a long way. So we'll do polynomial long division. x squared plus 4x plus 2 needs to divide into 3x to the 4th plus x cubed plus 2x squared plus 1. Okay, so we want to think of something we can multiply to x squared to make it into 3x to the 4th. So that's clearly 3x squared. Now we distribute this 3x squared over all of those. That's going to give us 3x squared uh, plus 12x cubed and then plus 6x squared. Now we need to subtract this, so that's going to give us minus 11x cubed and then uh, minus 4x squared plus 1 after bringing the plus 1 down. Now we need something to multiply into x squared to make 11x cubed and it's got to be negative, so that's going to be minus 11x. So that's going to give us minus 11x cubed, and let's see, minus 44x squared, and then minus 22. Now we need to subtract that. So let's see, that's going to give us 0 here, that'll give us 40x squared here, and then that'll give us a plus 23 here. Okay, good. And then finally, we need to multiply something into x squared to give us 40x squared. So that's going to be 40. So we're going to do uh, 40x squared uh, plus 160x um, plus 80. And now we need to subtract all of this. So let's see what that gives us. Uh, that's going to give us nothing for the x squared terms, minus 160x 
And then let's see what that's going to be. Minus 57. Good. So what that tells us is we can write f of x equals 3x squared minus 11x plus 40 times g of x and then plus negative 160x minus 57. So there's our quotient and here's our remainder. Okay, good. I'll clean up the board and then we'll redo this, but we'll do it over z5 adjoint x. Okay, now we're ready to do this over z5 adjoint x, but we're going to take the same strategy. We're going to divide x squared plus 4x plus 2 into 3x to the 4th plus uh, x cubed plus 2x squared plus 1. So it's going to look pretty similar. We're just going to reduce mod 5 at every step. So we we'll start off by multiplying by 3x squared. That's going to give us 3x to the 4th plus 12x cubed, but 12 is the same thing as 2 in z5, so we can write 2x cubed. And then plus 6x squared, but 6 is the same thing as 1 in z5, so that's the same thing as plus x squared. Great. Now we're going to go ahead and uh, subtract here. So we get 3 minus 3 is 0, and then uh, 1 minus 2 is negative 1, but in z5, negative 1 is the same thing as 4x cubed. Great. And then 2 minus 1 is 1, so that's going to give us plus x squared plus 1. Okay, good. Now, we need to multiply by 4x, and that's going to give us a 4x cubed down here, and then a plus... Uh, 16x squared, but 16 is the same thing as 1 in z5, so that's going to be plus x squared. And then plus 8x, but 8x is the same thing as 3x in z5. So we have that. Now we need to go ahead and subtract that. So notice uh, this is going to cancel this, this is going to cancel this, and we're going to left, be left with minus 3x plus 1, but minus 3 is the same thing as plus 2. So we have 2x plus 1, and that is our remainder. So in other words, in this case, we can write f of x equals 3x squared plus 4x times g of x and then plus 2x plus 1. So here we have quotient and remainder. Good. And that's a good place to stop.